Worldwide parent coach and conscious educator Sue DeCaro is on a mission to revitalize the joy in parenting. Welcome to Conscious Parents, Thriving Kids, a podcast designed to help parents all over the world create deeper connections with themselves and their children while overcoming life's daily parenting challenges. Listen in if you want to bring more laughter, love, and enjoyment to your home life. Welcome to Conscious Parents Thriving Kids, a place for all things parenting. I am your host, Sue DeCaro. I am excited to share this time with my special guest on this episode, Matt Barnes. We have an incredible episode for you. So Matt is the husband of a wife that he does not deserve and the father of three high schoolers who are his greatest inspiration. These are Matt's words. One of his children is in public school, one who studies in a hybrid homeschooling online mashup, and one who is a straight-A public school student that quit at age 15 to create her own educational path. Matt has run an education reform nonprofit, consulted with school districts in Texas and Oklahoma, and served on nine educational boards, including a selective public university, a private college, a Head Start system, and everything in between. He blogs at theeducationgame.com and works to inspire parents to adopt a 21st century learning model that shamelessly focuses on the student. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. Glad to be here. Super excited. You know, Matt, one of the things that I think my audience would love to hear about is what is the 21st century learning model that focuses mm. on the student? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just, I just, <laughs> just had a meal with an, an old friend and we talked about this very subject. He's got uh, three actually triplets who are in high school now. And so he's um, wrestling with some of these very questions. But um, when I talk about 21st century learning model, um, I compare, you have to first kind of think about what we all grew up with. Like everyone, every one of your listeners grew up in the same educational model, which I would argue is the 20th century model, which is um, high reliance on grades and completion. That's like the em emphasis on school. What are your grades and have you completed the assignments in front of you? Um, that leaves very little creativity in the, in the eyes of the child to figure out what it is that they want to study. Um, it's, it's again a very kind of a, a model that was, you know, normal. The 21st century, however, it is so dynamic. Uh, there's so much disruption. Technology has just changed the game in so many ways. Um, that now, instead of grades and completion, we're really starting to focus now on curiosity and investigation, where there are no clear solutions to complicated problems. There are only more questions that come up on how to tackle some of these problems, whether it's you know, things like global warming or politics or you know, uh, economics. Um, we need kids that are much more flexible and who are kids who... Um, know what they want to explore and are given the freedom to do so. It doesn't typically happen in education nowadays, unfortunately, but that is where we are moving as a society uh, and coronavirus has actually accelerated that. I, I love that you share this because I think a lot of families struggle with how to enhance the motivation of our children. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. motivation isn't really about the grades and completion, the outcome, right? Right. They study hard so you can get good grades in every subject, even the ones you absolutely can't stand and are troublesome <laughs> for you. Right. And so really tapping into the freedom to explore because mm -hmm. one child may be interested in global warming, as you said, and mm -hmm. another child may be interested in the astronauts in space and what that looks yep. like. Yep. And incorporating these opportunities for them to explore areas of interest Mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. and, and areas of curiosity is huge for children to feel yes. motivated and good at something. A sense and of inspired. And inspired, absolutely. And inspired, yep. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, again, my, the conversation, I wish we had recorded the conversation I had, you know, what, 20 minutes ago with my friend because, you know, he's got one kid who is, um, uh, you know, very tied into the old model and very focused on grades, but another student who is not motivated. Um, and I said, well, you know, you got to ask her what I call the, um, the killer question. And that is daughter, what are you 
curious about? What are the things that you want to understand more? And right now in coronavirus, here's this, here's this like this weird um, irony of this opportunity of coronavirus. We talk a lot about the gloom and doom, but there's the opportunity for families to now for the first time say, we have some space to actually delve into areas that you personally are interested in, son or daughter. Um, but what are those areas? And now let's create a personalized kind of learning model a learning plan for you rather than necessarily following exclusively the learning plan that your school might be providing. And, and that's a remarkable opportunity for families that are, you know, intentionally trying to parent. Absolutely. And not only does it help the child, but it helps the parent to learn more about their children. And oh, I agree point. with you. You know, I, there's a lot of negativity that we could focus on with coronavirus, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot that we're learning and, and seeing and adapting to. Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. are our children, the resiliency. You know, my, my, just to kind of go in this direction a little bit, my daughter said to me that she's sad that her five-year-old has to think about social distancing. And I said, yeah, but that's a really incredible thing to learn about what social distancing is. I remember years ago, we tried to teach yeah. our kids about personal space because they didn't know. They didn't right. Get it. And now they're really learning about personal space. So that's anyway, that's a little side note, but I agree yeah. this curiosity is, and I think in conversations we've had in the past, uh, I've shared with you that that is one of my favorite questions. Yeah. As an educator or as a parent, we need to bring more curiosity to the table to understand the other, whether it's mm. an adult or child in our lives that can share where they're coming from. We all have different perspectives interpretations, interests, thoughts. And right. when we can bring that neutrality by using that word, we're giving space to the other to share what's truly going on in their mind and body. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's also, for, for those of us who came up through the 20, 20th century kind of learning model though, it, it's hard for us to objectively ask that question and not bring judgment in the answer, um, right? So if a child says, I'm interested in, I don't know, pick your esoteric idea, um, it, parents, you have to be really careful to not say, why would you be interested in that? As opposed to, you know, <laughs> these, these things that are valued by society, whether it is, you know, medicine or engineering or law, these kind of uh, subject area uh, interests. Uh, so it's a caution for families that might be listening, really be naturally and kind of intentionally curious, regardless of the answer that you get, there is an opportunity to to delve into that space. And I can give you some examples if you'd like, but um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a place we need to be real careful to, to know our own motivations around these questions. Absolutely. I'd, I'd love to hear an example, but one thing I will share is that silence is an important part of this because, mm. you know, again, in the connection with our children, we want our children to share. I, I hear this from parents all over the world, you know, as I really want to have that connection with my child so my child can come to me with anything. Well, mm. that means you have to be open to hear anything, right? right and, right. you know, you can take time and, and revisit something they share with you the next day, two days later, or a week later, after you've had a chance to process and think about it. Hmm. Good so in the moment of bringing curiosity, which was a very neutral word, it's not coming loaded until you load it afterward. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah. when you come to it with curiosity, and then you listen, and you you uh, bring ideas like saying, hmm, or interesting, or mm -hmm. wow, and not any other response. You know, so really just listening, practicing silence to listen and hear what your child is saying, not yeah. to respond, but yeah. just to hear. So I'd love to hear one of your examples. I think it would be great. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, let's, if we think about what's the objective here in asking the question, there are many objectives, but one of them is that we're trying to build an, an independent learner, a child who doesn't require someone to tell them what they need to learn. And again, in the 21st century, that is going to be a really important skill set, um, a, a child's awareness that they can learn anything at any time if they have the motivation to do so, rather than, again, someone instructing them to do so. Um, so an example would be, you know, a kid who now again in our home, I'll just I'll just be honest. In our home, we we don't do video games, and we're very we don't have a TV in the house. Haven't had one in years. We we really try to emphasize books. 
and create a culture around um, kind of simple, uh, simple pleasures. But I know a lot of kids and families, if you ask the kid what are they interested in, they will say video games, right? Um, Fortnite is like the big one, right? Mm-hmm. It seems like every kid is, is tied to Fortnite at some point. And so that's a place where, again, I would have a hard time hearing that objectively. But uh, I then started to realize, okay, well, how could we create a learning plan around Fortnite, right? There's all these questions that come up like, well, how, you know, who built Fortnite? Like, wh- what's the company that runs this? What are their revenues? Who, uh, what, tell me about the, the, the founders. What were their history? Um, what does is, what is the coding of something like this look like? Right? You could explore coding. You could go bigger and go, let's, let's actually study the evolution of video games, right? That, that could get you into history. It can get you into um, areas, again, that the child has interested in, interest in. Um, but so the thinking here is if you create a learning plan around something, you know, in my view is, <laughs> I'm going to put judgment words in here, but as, as, uh, as a time waster as a video game, you actually could create a learning plan that the child is, is actually really interested in and you cover some of the very same concepts that you might in a traditionally structured classroom, uh, but the child is now leading it, the child is interested in it, the child is digging in, um, uh, and that, that creates a, a child who actually can own their learning in a way that's not possible. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. And, yeah. you know, I, we, we can try to avoid technology or some other thing that our child mm-hmm. may be interested in that has absolutely no interest, you know, for us and, and perhaps we're, you know, adverse to it. Yeah. But that's not helping the child. That's and right. so, you know, it's really about seeing the student, seeing the child, seeing this lovely being, this human being in front of you and all their interests, whether you like them or not, you know, right. so often we want our children to, you know, in the past, we've been conditioned to want our children to be like us, you know, following uh-huh. our footsteps. Wow, I was really good at piano, so you take piano too. Yeah. We didn't have video games like they have now, or at least not my my <laughs> my growing up years. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I had a client, just to take it a step further, I had a client who every time her child wanted a game or an app, um, mm-hmm. we created a, an avenue for that child to present it. So the, the child, let's say, you know, wanted to download, I don't know all the games, but whatever, some yeah, game. Yeah, pick one, yeah. The child had to go and research who mm. makes the game, mm-hmm. what the game was about, what were the pitfalls of the game, you know, and the, and yeah. the interest, and share that with the family. So Love the it. child was actually learning whether this game was made in a way that was supportive of her and her nature. because. As you know, some of the games that are made for our children are made and people are hired actually to bring an arena of um, of addiction to the backside of it. I mean, you know, there are companies that actually are hiring consultants to bring addictive qualities to these Mm -hmm. games. Yep. And they're trying to hide it, but, you know, you can you can find it out there if you do your research. So, wow, wouldn't it be great for our children to find out if this is something that took place and right. share that with us? So the learning is an enormous aspect, no matter what they're interested in. It's Absolutely. about the child in front of you. Yeah. Well, you just talk, you're, what you're describing is media intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is so, man, oh man, not only is that, the, you know, you need to understand that in video games, but in social media, the same addictive strategies that are used in casinos are actively used in social media. So as, and again, we've done this with our own kids, we've talked to them, we've studied what, um, what social media does to a kid, what, uh, how it's structured. And how, you know, there's data on this, how uh, kids who are very tied into social media end up becoming more likely to be depressed, more likely to compare themselves with others, more likely to conform to, you know, whatever they're seeing. And these are, and these, it's a great conversation to have with the kids before involving themselves in, you know, a social media site or, or a video game. That's a great idea. I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that and write that down. I don't hope you don't mind. <laughs> not at all. Not <laughs> at all. But, you know, I, I, I love how you describe it as media intelligence. And mm-hmm. we have to raise children 
that have this intelligence so that they can navigate this themselves. They're not always going to be with us. They're not always mm -hmm. going to hear our voices in their head that say, you know, why this might not be good for you. They have to be part of feeling empowered in the knowledge of understanding this, so just true. like everything else, just like whether they're interested in science or history, they're going to be interested in social media. We have to take that step to include them and to help them navigate by the educational process and the research right. behind it. That's right. That's right. Yep. So good stuff. Yeah, I'm curious because I know you have lots of knowledge um, in this arena of education, and I'm curious what your thoughts are. You know, so many schools are opening and closing, some are not even opening, mm. and, you know, we're faced again in this fall time period with homeschooling, if you want to call it that, or educating our children from the home. Mm -hmm. What kind of suggestions or thoughts would you like to offer parents to move through their worries and to really find a healthy balance for themselves yeah. and for their children. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, great question. And, and, and we can cover this for the next three hours. Is that <laughs> or okay? Or more, right. <laughs> right. So I'll, how about the abbreviated version? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, yeah. Right. So first off, um, what I would say is that, you know, there's, uh, gosh, how do I even tackle this? Um, all right, let's first understand that there's a power shift that's happening right now. Um, a year ago at this time, uh, schools decided when kids would show up in class, what they would learn, um, the, the manner and, you know, they would learn it, whether through a book or through a computer or, you know, didactic, whatever, lecture. Um, they decided essentially everything about your child's academic progression. Uh, even, you know, what, what courses your child was eligible to take. Um, and parents had very little to say about that. They could choose the school, but they really couldn't choose much of what's happening inside of the school. Couldn't choose their teacher, typically couldn't choose uh, different coursework that were not part of the structure. But now, in this environment, um, all that's now being questioned, right? Parents are in the position to say, you know what, I don't like my child learning in this way. Right? I don't like my child being on a computer for four hours a day. That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't work for us. So now parents are going to increasingly be in a position to negotiate with the school around what works for their family and their situation. And that not, not just works what works practically, but what works emotionally, what works um, culturally for your, your specific family. So this is a real transition, right? Schools are uncomfortable with that kind of negotiation because historically they've been the decision maker. Mm -hmm. But parents now are, are in a position that they can now do that. And so I would encourage parents to really think about what do you want your child to learn? How do you want them to learn that? And then begin to create a strategy around it. So this is now the second part. So the first part was power. The second part is a plan. Creating a learning plan for the child and then producing or introducing that uh, to your child's teacher, as an example, right? So I had a conversation with, um, in really interesting conversation two days ago with 25 Arabic speaking moms um, who were trying to figure out how to work education right now. By the way, I, was the, I think I was the first male to interact with this group ever, um, but they're really desperate to figure it out. And so this idea of building a learning plan uh, meant for these parents, parents um, you know, recognizing that they have maybe four kids all at different grade levels. Um, and so instead of trying to read four different books at, you know, at the same time, maybe you pick one book and all the families read it together or the older child reads it out loud in English and then helps to, uh, you know, translate it for the mom. Uh, and then the other kids uh, learn alongside. And so that's a learning model that might work better for a family with a mom at home and for uh, kids at different grade levels. But again, that's a plan that is individualized to the family. Mm. Um, and, and that part is, again, where schools are typically uncomfortable because they never really had to think about family dynamics. There was a structure and a curriculum that was predetermined. Um, so power differential is, is shaping how this new world of education looks. 
and then parents being empowered to make a plan, a learning plan that actually is customized to the family and the child. And again, as you're developing, the, developing a learning plan, that's where individual conversations with the child can come in. Like, what are you curious about? All right, let's find books on that subject. Let's, let's look at documentaries on that subject. Um, let's, let's think about the history of that subject. Those are, those are completely different conversations and, and part of what makes this a uh, challenging time for families, but also a wonderful opportunity uh, in the midst of the challenge. Yeah, and looking at the opportunity is such an important process. Looking mm -hmm. at, you know, the power shift, looking at the learning model for your particular family and children. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that that people take lightly, number one, and not something that people realize they can actually advocate for yeah. their children and start to look at what education looks like for them and their family. Yeah. And I think, yeah, right. you know, that's crucial because when these kids do go back to, you know, brick and mortar, every child is going to have to be met where they are. And mm -hmm. it's going to be a challenge, perhaps, but one the school systems are going to have to, you know, really dive into. Or yeah. perhaps parents decide that they're going to do more education at home. Once well, they get the hang of it, they might more and more might do this, right? That's right. That's, and that's where I was going to jump in, right? So as parents start to realize, wow, my child is interested. Again, one of the great stories, one of the families we worked with, um, you know, the, the mom asked the daughter the killer question, what are you curious about? And daughter mentioned lobsters. Like, who knows where that came from? But she was really curious about lobsters. And so um, I encouraged the mom to listen, go, and this is over the summer, I encouraged mom to just start buying as many, find as much as you can, can about lobsters and books um, and, uh, and begin to delve into that. Another kid uh, said that she was really curious about what was under her skin, which to me is like, this was like a six-year-old. I'm like, oh my gosh, you, you just, you, you hit the jackpot. The next 10 years, you could be dip, diving into what's happening underneath a person's skin and, you know, all parts, beautiful parts of the body. Um, but so when that child goes back to school, now the question is, do we continue learning about these areas that my child has interest or do we put those things down? and now learn about what the school has decided or bureaucrat has decided science to look like for this child. Mm. That becomes a real conflict. And I'm arguing for families that you should, if, if your daughter has expressed interest in learning what's under the skin, that it's worth your advocacy to say to the school, listen, you know, I know science is important and I know you have a science curriculum, but I'm gonna now, I'd like to actually explore this other aspect of science because my daughter has interest in it. And here's my plan. Can you help me with that plan? And I need us to limit the amount of science that you are pushing because I am now replacing it with things that um, my daughter has expressed interest in. That is, again, a very different conversation, but a lot of parents already are seeing and saying, well, oh, I, don't, I don't know if I want to go back to the old model in, in its entirety where I just turn over learning to, to the system. Um, I may want to actually be more engaged in this permanently. And I think that's a really good thing. Yeah, definitely. It's something for parents to really think about. You are the advocate for your child. Yeah. And, right. and you're the advocate for them at home. And you're the advocate for them with the school system, whether they're in school or not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is also a positive aspect of the time we're in right now is look at it as an opportunity to really step in and understand your children much more, see what the learning model needs to be for your child, and, and see what your child's curiosity really is so that you can navigate with them and for them yeah, to help yeah. them to step into what really speaks to them. I think right. it's a, just an incredible opportunity. Yeah, I do too. I'm, I'm, um, I'm excited. Uh, at the possibilities. At the same time, we've got to be really clear that there are a lot of families who, um, I mean, they, they don't have the space to really wrestle with some of these things we're talking about. At the same time, every parent has some space. And part of our work is to work with any parent, regardless of their ability to support you know, our work, to, again, define the learning plan that meets and works with their individual family. So another great story is a, you know, a mom who's um, 
Uh, she's, she's doesn't speak English. She, uh, she's lives in a very poor part of, of Houston. Um, goes to schools that many of us would consider pretty crummy. There's kids go to those schools, but at every dinner, that family is reading. The daughter reads out loud in English and then translates to her child or to her family every single evening. And when libraries were open every single weekend, every Saturday, they would go to the library and get eight, nine, 10 books. And that would be what they would consume over the course of that week. Now that is a behavior that any family could do. The question is, will families realize the value of that behavior, not just for the child, but also for the family? Now the family is learning about a topic as a group. So now that we have a whole new language to talk about whatever the whatever the topic of the book is. You know, I remember our, our kids, we read, um, um, uh, what was it called? Children, or Lord of the Flies mm-hmm. uh, a few years ago. And of course, now, whenever we're talking about, you know, kids, we talk about Lord of the Flies and, you know, classrooms where the kids are in charge, Lord of the Flies, right? So it creates a new language and a new culture around a family. So that's something that every family can do. Um, and part of our job is to make sure that every family understands the value of that, not just to their child, but to the culture of the home as well. Uh, you, that's beautifully said. Absolutely. So Matt, I'm sure people who are listening want to know where they can find out more about you and connect with you and hear more from you in terms of your incredible wisdom and knowledge. You uh, well, thank you about the incredible wisdom and knowledge. I, 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 I have learned all this from other parents who are much more wise and, and knowledgeable than I have. I'm just regurgitating it. So, uh, but thank you for that. Uh, yeah. So um, I can be found at theeducationgame.com. That's where I blog. Uh, my my partner, um, uh, my business partner, a guy named uh, Scott Van Beck, who is a longtime teacher, um, dean of instruction, principal, uh, assistant superintendent who oversaw 60 schools, and then he ran an education reform nonprofit for a number of years, built schools, et cetera. We, we are working on this project together to take advantage of uh, COVID, to, to actually make COVID into a uh, a groundswell of change that actually improves education over the long term. So the education uh, for families who want to call uh, or set up a, t- a conversation with me one-on-one, I, I provide that for free to the point where I, you know, until I can't, you know, service anymore. But mm-hmm. uh, so if your, fa- your, your family's welcome to schedule a, an appointment. You can see that on the website um, under contact. Um, and we would have a, you know, 20, 30 minute conversation about their circumstance and, and propose some solutions and see if we can help them start to move in on this movement of benefiting from COVID rather than being a victim of it. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Well, it has been an honor and a privilege to chat with you and spend this time with you. I appreciate you sharing all Thank that you. you have shared today. And I'm sure our listeners will want to reach out and connect with you and learn more and have you help them with their specific plans so that together we can really shift the educational process. Awesome. Awesome. Would love it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's great talking with you. And, and, uh, and I, I'm a fan of your work. So please continue doing it. And I will be one of your many consumers of it. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate yeah. it. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us. Remember, every moment is a new moment for Conscious Connections. Thanks for listening to Conscious Parents, Thriving Kids. If you like what you heard, the best compliment you can give us is to share this podcast with a friend. And be sure to give us some stars and a favorable review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in.